today we're going to be talking about teamwork makes the dream work. Amen. You ever hear that teamwork makes it marriage is a team sport. And the more that you understand that, the more that you understand that, that God designed us to work together, to be in sync with each other, the more success you're going to have. Someone said that, that marriage is like a, a three-legged race, or you know, like a potato sack race. You, you try to get ahead of your spouse, you're both going to fall, right? And some of you probably have, have tried that, or maybe you're in a scenario right now where you feel like, well, I just do my thing, he does his thing, she does his thing, we just kind of, we do our own thing. And if you have not already experience some falling and stumbling, you're going to. You were not designed to run that way. You're designed to flow and work with each other, to run together. And when you work together, you will experience success. Marriage is a team sport. You guys know this verse, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. Let's say it all out loud. One, two, three, two are better than one. Two are better than one. That's right. God designed you for this relationship. There is no other relationship. You guys heard me say it. There is no other relationship that God will give you that will test you more. Come on, married people. Amen. But we will also bring you the joy and intimacy and community and so many things that God just develops our faith and our character and our patience and our it, so many things are developed in this because that God actually designed two, two truly are, are better than one. Let me, these aren't in your notes, but, but some of you guys are in this phase of your, of your relationship. You've just barely coming together and you're at this beginning. Coming together is a beginning. And maybe some of you are at this beginning stage of teamwork and figuring it, figuring it out. You're at the beginning stage. Some of you guys are at this stage where you're keeping together is progress. You're figuring out how to just keep it together. Maybe in the season or stage of life that you're in. Maybe it's work patterns have changed. Children dynamics have changed. Career paths have changed. You're just trying to figure out how do we keep together in this season. What I'd like to talk about today, though, is how working together will bring success. That God designed us to work together. So here's what I want to do today. I want to talk about how why teamwork is hard work. Why is it so hard to work as a team, and we're going to discuss that, and then we're going to talk about um, how to build a successful team in marriage, and I had a lot of, again, a lot of fun with this, with this series, so what I, what I did is I studied the um, iconic, legendary Hall of Fame coaches and how they built their teams and what they did to, to build successful teams that would go on to win Super Bowls and championships, and so I'm going to share with you what I, what I discovered today. And so we'll get to that. But first, but first, why is teamwork hard work? If you're taking notes, you guys, you should have got something in your, in your bulletin. You can go ahead and take those out. Write some notes with me today. Here's the first reason why teamwork is hard work, and that is busyness. Because we're just so, let's face it, you guys, we're, we're busy people. With, with all of our responsibilities and our homework and our careers and our finances and budgeting and and kids and chores and the myriad of other responsibilities it's so hard to intentionally and strategically like game plan and invest into our marriage and we're so busy that when we when we actually do invest in our marriage it just feels like more work a lot of times but it's just something that it's just another thing that we need to do so what we end up doing is just ignoring a lot of the issues that rear their head up in our relationship, some of the challenges. And so we're just too busy to deal with that. I don't got the time to deal with that. I'm just, and so we end up just learning how to exist together, then do life together, then work together on the same team because we're just so, we're just so busy. That's why one of the reasons why teamwork is hard work. There's a few scriptures about this. Psalm 127 says, it's senseless for you to work so hard from early morning until late, not, late at night. God wants his loved ones to get their proper Rest. It's not it, worth it for you to be so busy all the time. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 says only someone too stupid to find his way home would wear himself out with work. Some of you guys need to find your way back home. But you, you, you spent way too much time out of the home. And for, I'm sure, great excuses and great reasons, you're taking care of your family. And I believe there's, there is a season for everything. But you were designed to, to, to do life together, to be a team. All right, and, and one of the reasons why it's just hard work is we're so busy. It's just the culture we live in. Here's another reason, selfishness. And man, this reason right here is the number one enemy of a great marriage. 
selfishness, where, where we just get my needs. What about my needs? What about my opinion? What about my desire? What about my career? What about, what about my, what about me? What about, you ever heard there's no I in team? There's no I in team. Someone said, but there is a me. <laughs> You're dyslexic. There ain't no me in team. <laughs> I don't care what you said. That's funny. Sometimes this thing, though, this, this sneaks up on us. Because we're, we're, we're selfish by nature, but a lot of times our relationships and our marriages don't start out that way, do they? I mean, because when it started, we're like, you know, we serve each other and do, love each other and love each other the way that they want to be loved. And we do things and little nice things and go out of our way. We'll go across the world, you know, to show our love for our newly married spouse. After a while, this thing creeps in. Forget about across the world. Don't even go across the room to get the remote anymore, you know? You start measuring distances. No, it's the same distance between both of us. You get it yourself, you know? It's this selfishness that'll creep in. It is the, I'm telling you, it's, it's the, one of the greatest enemies of a healthy marriage. And it's one of the reasons why teamwork is just hard work, because we're just selfish by, by nature. Mark chapter 8, 36 says, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world? What good is it if you to get your way? Your career, your ideas, your opinions, yet you forfeit the things that matter most in your life. What good is it if you, if, if, hey, great job, you're a great success in your field of work, great job. You made a lot of money, but you lost fur. What good is it if, if you gain everything, but you forfeit your soul, he says. Why teamwork is hard work, here's another reason. Lack of practice. Lack of practice. Can you imagine a Super Bowl team showing up to play in the Super Bowl but never having practiced before? Or even for, like, like the chaos that would be on the field, right? They wouldn't know what roles to play, what positions to play. They wouldn't know what the game plan was for their opponent. And a lot of the, the problems and the challenges that we face in our relationship, you guys, they're not really, it's not really the problem, it's the practice. That's, that's, it's practice in perseverance. It's practice in, in patience. It's practicing our faith. It's practice in our love. That's what it is, man. We're learning it, it together, learning it. It takes practice. It, the, the essential skills for a healthy marriage, you know, like communication, conflict management, fi even financial planning, parenting, do you think those things are developed by themselves? How many of you guys know it takes skill to build a healthy marriage? And it takes, it takes practice. You've got to practice at this thing. You've got to practice in your healthy marriage. Uh, Philippians chapter 4 says, What you have learned, Paul talking about here, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, here's what I want you to do. Practice them. What good is it if you came to church and you heard some great stuff, man? When, when the problem came, the challenge came, the issue came in your marriage, that's when Paul said, hey, practice these things. And if you do that, if you practice the things that, that, that I taught you, he says, the God of peace will be with you, all right? That's one of the reasons, again, teamwork is hard work because we just, we lack practice in these things. Here's, here's one that goes kind of overlooked, the last one, a coachless team. That's why teamwork is hard work. We don't have a coach on the sideline helping us out. You see, a good coach can bring out the best in us. A good coach will motivate you, will inspire you. A good coach will, will, will cheer you on, but also hold you accountable, even bring correction at times. A good coach is on the sideline offering wisdom and advice and experience. And your marriage, check it out, your marriage needs a coach. And a coach can come in a lot of different forms or ways. A coach can come in the form of a book that you're reading, right? A coach can come in the form of a small group that you guys are attending together, that small group bringing accountability and growth. A coach can come, like, like what we're doing today. They, they, this is coaching. You know that? Like, honestly, this is a great definition, a term for what I get to do with you guys every week. I th it's an honor, honestly, to speak into your life and coach you in your life and in your marriage. And I don't have all the answers, but I know the one who does. And I can, like, I can stand on the sideline and go and offer you some wisdom and some advice and some motivation and sometimes some accountability and correction. And I can point you in the right direction and honestly just by just by coming to church like once a week you're you're getting a leg up on a lot of people for your marriage and your life because you're you're opening yourself up to coaching it's one of the reasons why that teamwork is hard work because we don't have coaches in our life and i have 
Veronica and I have different people in our lives for the different areas of life. We have people in our life for our marriage that we know we can get coaching from. And, and just like you, there, t- there, there is sometimes struggles and difficulties that we need someone on the sidelines speaking in to our life. And I'll have someone, see, I'll, I have a coach for my leadership, someone to call for pastoring, communication, different areas of my life that I know I got some coaches on the sideline that can help me out. Um, Moses was a reluctant leader at first. Some of you guys know the story. When Moses was first called by God, he was reluctant to like take the position, take the assignment from God. He made excuses like, like I'm, I, I can't speak well, I'm not eloquent enough there's got to be someone else and but over over the course of time we see Moses like exercise great leadership like he didn't think he had the skills but he led thousands of Israelites out of bondage through the Red Sea and into the he he was a actually a great leader it was his anointing his character there are a lot of things that made him a great leader but he was leading so many people and he was doing it all alone and you were not listen you were not called to do this life alone two are better than one and so he was in numbers chapter 11 uh, Moses speaking here he said I alone am not able to carry all these people this is too much because it's too burdensome for me here he was trying to do everything by himself and he was cr- being crushed under the weight of the calling under the weight of the leadership trying to do it by himself. But thank God for his father-in-law, Jethro, who steps into his life as a coach, who gives him some, some, some advice from the sidelines. He says, Moses, you're going to kill yourself. You keep going at it like this. You, you, what you need to do is, is, is actually set up, you need to empower some people and set up some more leaders. Depending on their gifting, Moses, you can go read his advice. Depending on their gifting, some people can lead 10, some people can lead 50s, 100, some people can lead thousands. Moses, you need to empower other people to lead, and you only handle the very hard cases, Moses. You're going to kill yourself. You need some people, some coaches in your life, sometimes to correct you, sometimes to redirect you. And that's one of the reasons why, why teamwork is just very hard work is because we don't have coaches in our life speaking into our life, whether it's motivation or correction or encouragement. We think that we can make it alone and make it by ourselves. We think we have all the answers. And Moses was very talented. Like I said, he was a good leader. But talent may win some games, but teamwork wins championships. Come on, somebody. Amen. Huh? It, it, talent, you can win some, you'll get by with some talent, but if you want to go to the Super Bowl, if you want to win you a championship, it, you're going to have, it takes teamwork to win championships. So what I did is I, is I studied those championship coaches, and, and it, was, it was fun. I had a lot of fun in this series, you guys, I really did. I'm looking forward to the next one, I really am, but I had fun with this one. And I studied these, these championship legendary coaches, and what I'd like to share with you is, is how to build a successful team. And this applies, I'm telling you, it applies to marriage, and I'll show you how it applies to marriage. This will apply to probably every area of life if you're on a team. If you're on a team somewhere, say you're on a team in ministry, a dream team even here at Discovery, maybe you um, serve on a team in your place of business, or maybe even you lead a team. These will work. These, these will work. They're biblical principles, but legendary coaches actually use them. Five ways to build a successful team. Here they are, you guys. Number one, successful teams have a soft heart. Successful teams have developed care and chemistry. Football is not a, you know, not an overly sensitive game. It takes like acute focus, but but it was it was Vince Lombardi who actually a legend a legendary coach who who brought feeling to the field. A lot of his coaching philosophy is still used today. But he what he discovered was that you can have the right game plan, you can have the right fundamental to, fundamentals and even discipline and still lose games. The third ingredient he said is is the key ingredient, which is love. It's when you it's when teammates actually care for one another. They love one another. He is in my reading, he actually he they developed the power sweep. I'm talking to the men now, I know. Ladies, I, I'm just trying to help you out. Your men are going to be able to talk about the sermon later, okay? So make sure you take advantage later on tonight. Talk about this, this sermon because it's going to register for them. It's like last week. You know, last week when we talked about the boxes and how men's mind works and women, 
My, there was this, just yesterday, a lady was, one, one couple was talking to us, and she said, I've been telling my husband that for I don't know how many years, but then you say it on one Sunday, and all of a sudden the light bulb comes on, okay? <laughs> I'm helping you ladies, you ladies out here with this, okay? So they developed, the, he coached the Green Bay Packers, they developed a power sweep. The power sweep is, is, a, is a very long play, a handoff play that goes, and the linemen basically abandon their line, and they sweep out together, together and they form this, this blockade, if you will. And they describe that how much trust and care that, that you need, that you need to, you, need, you, gotta, you gotta be able to care about the person beside you and behind you in order for that play to run correctly. God designed couples to care for one another. We call it love, you guys. And, and, and we're designed by God to express this love over a lifetime, okay? Uh, Proverbs chapter 5 says, Bless your fresh-flowing fountain. Enjoy the wife you married as a young man, lovely as an angel, beautiful as a rose. Don't ever quit. Someone say, don't ever quit. Don't ever quit on that. What does he say? Don't ever quit taking delight in her body. We're not going to go there again. That was last week, okay? You go check that out. I had too much fun last week. Never take her love for granted. Okay, successful teams, they have a soft heart. And throughout your, throughout, this is the challenge here when it comes to our marriages. We'll, we'll get into challenges and difficulties, difficult seasons, maybe even imperfections in, you know, of our spouse can happen as well. And we allow that not, not to... We, our soft heart, although it started out very soft, we, it gets harder and harder and harder, and we get bitter towards the one that we used to be soft and treated tenderly. And you have a couple, you have like three responses I've found through all the challenges of, of your life, the difficulties that you experience. You have three different responses, and it's your choice how you respond, okay? People are going to fail you. You're going to have trial and tribulation, but how you respond is up to you. The first response that I see a lot of people respond, they get bitter. They allow their heart to get hard and they get bitter toward each other. That's a response some of you have maybe, maybe responded with your spouse to. The second response is maybe you don't get bitter. Some of you have gotten brittle where you feel like a piece of, you know, cracked glass. So it's not that you're hard against the person that you love, your spouse, you're, you're just you're overly sensitive. You're, 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 no, 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 you're not going to have that conversation. You're not going to go there. I just feel like a, I can't even, I'm not, I can't deal with it. I'm like, a, like if I just get one more tap, I'm going to shatter. I'm just, I cannot handle another argument, another blowout, another. And that's a, that's a choice that we make, either brittle, bitter. And the third choice is a choice that some people make, and that's to allow it to make you better. That you don't have to actually, the challenges that you experience don't have to make you bitter. The failures and the shortcomings that you guys experience, they don't. If you're working as a team, they can make you better. They can make you a better husband. Yeah, even those shortcomings, even the difficult, even your own mistakes, they don't have to make you brittle or bitter. They can make you a better husband, a better wife, a better servant of God if you allow it to be. Can I get an amen? amen. Successful teams have a soft heart. Here's number two. Successful teams share the load. Share the load. Successful team, share the load, you guys. Um, I think uh, teamwork, it divides the tasks and multiplies the success. You know, I know that, that, that we all have different gifts and different strengths. And, and when you get married, you kind of fall into that, right? It's like, okay, you do that and, 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 and I do this. But somewhere along the way, when we stop, when we stop doing our Heart and sharing the load, that's where bitterness tends to creep in, in a lot of relationships, where, where we feel like one person is carrying way too much, not getting, not getting the help. And you know what? Depending on the season of your life and the stage of your marriage, there's just, there may be loads that you used to carry that, that your spouse is going to carry now. I used to do the finances, as an example. When we first started, I would do the finances in our marriage. But then it got to a point where I was carrying a big, heavy load, and it was crushed. It was, it was you know, heavy for me, and my wife saw, and I didn't even need to ask her to do it. She saw, because we were running together and in sync together. She felt the weight. She said, honey, I can take that. Let me take that for this season, and I'll, I'll do the finance. So she did it for a season. It's back on my plate this season, because we're doing this together. When, when we were raising our kids, and they were all little and running around, and, 
and, and acting crazy and in diapers and stuff. Can I talk to the men real quick, okay? Guys, if you got babies and you got them in diapers, don't you wait for her to ask you to change a diaper. You need to share. I'm serious. Share the load. Don't wait. Don't wait to ask uh, for her to ask you for a day off. What's that about a day off? Aren't you? A, you're a parent too. You're a dad. What are you talking about day off? You know what I mean? Okay, and then when, the, when you take the baby and the baby starts crying, don't hand the baby back. Share the load. You guys, it's, it's, it, you're a team. And when you do that together, successful teams, they do it. They share the load. All right? Uh, the NFL teams know, this, the good teams, the good coaches know, no individual player can win you the games. It's, not, it's, it's teams and teamwork that wins championships. God created couples to be at their best when they work together. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 says, it's better to have a partner than to go it alone. Share the work. You guys, share the work, man. Don't let, don't let your partner be buried under those responsibilities. Share that. Share the wealth. And if one falls down, the other helps. But if there's no one to help them, that's when it gets tough. And I see so many couples that, that feel like this. They feel like there's no one to help them when God designed this very relationship to be your help. He said, it's not good for man to be alone. Let me, I, need to give him, I need to give him some help. You guys need to help each other. And I meet couples who are feel like crushed and pressured by the responsibilities of life, yet they have a helper next to them who isn't sharing the load. And it creates bitterness. It does. It'll create bitterness and, div and division in your marriage. Successful teams learn how to share the load, share the responsibilities. Here's the third one. You guys, are you guys getting something out of this today, you guys? Successful teams, successful teams trust each other. Successful, and this, one's, uh, this one is, is typically very hard in our, the culture that we live in because we've experienced a lot of brokenness in our world. We, we, a lot of us come from broken families, broken homes, where we have experienced distrust. Maybe, maybe something, maybe even in previous relationships that we've had, there's been distrust and brokenness. And I've, and I've heard it often, you guys. People have this false belief. I don't know, maybe you've thought this or even said this, but it's a false belief. No one, here, here's the false belief. No one is trustworthy but God. No one's truly trustworthy but God. And I get it. I get where, I get where that, you know, that belief will come from. Because God, truly, he is trustworthy. And he is the only, you know, perfect one. But I'm, that, that, that belief, that false belief is not from God. And it'll keep you from, from having the marriage God designed you to have. Successful marriages, successful teams trust each other, yeah, you're not perfect. I get it. My wife's not perfect. I get it. But I still give her my heart. I still give her my heart. I trust her completely. Although, yep, she's not perfect, but I'm going to believe the best in her anyway. Amen, somebody? God created couples to trust each other. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says it this way. That love bears all things regardless of what comes and believes all things. I know you're imperfect, but I'm going to believe the best in you anyway. I know you don't, you don't always get it right, but I'm going to believe, I'm going to see the best inside of you. I'm going to look for the best in you all the time, no matter what. That's what love does. That's what love does. It hopes all things remain steadfast during difficult times because there will be some difficult times. It doesn't mean you stop giving your heart away. It's, it, I know it's, it creates some vulnerability, but, but in order to have a successful team, it takes some vulnerability. It takes for you to put yourself out there and trust. It endures all things without weakening. So when your husband gets you some flowers, don't think it was for ulterior motives, right? I mean, what's he hiding? What's he doing? You know, when he, you know his eyes glance this way and you think his, his, what were you looking at? You know, don't, don't, no, believe the best. Trust, trust, just offer some truth. Here's number four. Successful teams have great depth. They have great depth. This, was, this got the Philadelphia Eagles this year, man. Too many injuries. Second and third stringers couldn't hang, man. They couldn't. And I know every, everyone who like has, you know, follows a sport, that's the excuse every year. Oh, too many injuries, too many injuries. But the great teams and the great coaches, the great coaches, they understood this, that successful teams have great depth. They got a depth chart. They, they focus on the second, the third string. You know, they, got, they have great depth that can come in and win some games and pull some things out for them. Check it out. Your marriage is going gonna, is gonna to take some injuries. 
Your marriage is going to take some L's. Your marriage is going to take some, some hits and some blows. There's going to be difficulties. And you better have some depth in your marriage when it takes a blow. And when, when, when you don't, when couples don't have depth in their relationship, when difficulty or tragedy or things happen in life, whether it's whether the economy, the economy ain't never going to be good. It's not always going to be good. Sometimes it's going to tank. Maybe it's your career field. Maybe it's something with your health. It's not always going to be good. Your kids, when things happen in life and they inevitably will happen, if you don't have depth, instead of fighting with each other and for each other, you'll start fighting each other. And a lot of couples do that in the middle of the trouble. They start bickering and fighting inwardly instead of working in sync and fighting with and for each other. God designed it this way. Genesis chapter 2, all the way from the beginning, you guys. Therefore, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they shall be what? One flesh. God designed you for this depth of intimacy, this oneness. So, so how, do you, how do you develop depth? In marriage, there's a lot of different ways, but I want to give you some very, very practical, very practical ways that you can actually develop some depth in your marriage as as a, as a couple. You can even apply these, man. Some tonight, some tomorrow. You guys, I want to give you some very, very practical ways you can get some depth in your marriage. Okay, take some extra notes. Let me give you five of them. Okay, number one, ask open-ended questions. Don't stay away from the yes/no questions. Like like. Ask open-ended, how does that subject make you feel? Or what's important about that issue to you? Guys, I'm talking to you, okay? Ask the open-ended, get away from those easy questions. Number two, give your undivided attention. So put away the phone, turn off the TV, get, put, get, the, get away from the kids even. Give your undivided attention. If you want depth in that marriage, you're going to have to take some time and make it a priority in your relationship. Number three, learn together. Learn together, like the couple that is growing together stays together. So maybe it's you're, you're going to go through a Bible study together. Maybe you're going to watch some some DVD together or or some study together. And honestly, it doesn't even have to be, you know, couples oriented or even spiritual growth oriented. It could be any type of learning that you guys want to do together. Maybe it's it's financial. Maybe it's about budgeting or, or or Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. Maybe it's about parenting. Whatever it is, just do it together. Learn and grow together. Here's number four. Make it a game. Like have some fun. Make some, make some fun. Maybe out of stressful situations and difficult things, make it, make it a game. Let me give you an example. Like in our previous house that Veronica and I used to live in, we had these neighbors that would always dog us and scowl us when we came home. And it always irritated us. It's just like, man, what did they, well, you know, and, and, and I'm just being honest. It kind of like give them a little scowl back then. What you looking at kind of stuff. And, and then that's, that's just like, we, we caught it though. I was like, like, oh man. So let's just, Let's make this a game. Let's just see which one is going to be able to make the neighbor smile kind of thing, okay? Or let's make it a game. Abby, Abby, let, who can get Abby to do her homework, okay? So whatever it is that's like stressful or that's, that's even maybe even contentious, make it a game. Make it fun. Bring some fun into your marriage. Here's the last one. Tell stories. Tell stories. Tell stories about your day. Tell stories. Again, you want to stay away from just the basic facts. Explain why the subject is important. Who is impacted by it? Allowing yourself to be vulnerable with your spouse is the doorway to building a deeper relationship and a lasting marriage. Successful teams have great depth, and you got to work at going deeper, and you've you got to work at that oneness. It has, you have to work at it. All right, here's the last one. Number five, successful teams bring out your best. And that's what God truly designed this marriage, this relationship to do. God designed this, this relationship with your wife, with your husband, to bring out the best in you. Um, there's, a, there's an acronym for team. You may have heard it. Together, everyone achieves more. And that's, that's true in marriage, man. Like, that together, you can achieve more, so much more than you ever could by yourself. God designed it that way. I love Ephesians chapter 5 and the message paraphrase translation. I use this a lot in my counseling sessions and even in, in like weddings and stuff. I love it. And it's address, he addresses husbands, but I like to, like to communicate this to husbands and wives. It's good. It's just good advice for you to take. Check it out. Husbands, wives, go all out in your love for each other. Like, can you say that? Can you say that you have gone all out? Have you like gone all out? Have you left nothing back? Have you gone all out? 
in your love? Have you put yourself out there? Have you trusted completely? Have you loved completely? Have you honored completely? Have you, put, have you gone all out in your love exactly as Christ did for the church? You guys know how Christ loved us, don't you? He went to the full extent to demonstrate his love for us. He bled, he suffered, he died for us. It was a love marked by giving, not by getting. He, he wasn't promised to get us in return. He did it willingly, knowingly, that some of us would never choose him. But he did it anyway. He loved anyway, knowing that, so, that some were not going to even accept it. His love, his sacrifice. God, Christ's love makes the church whole. His words, now, now talking, this is, this is a good example. Of husbands, wives, how we can love each other. His words evoke her beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring out the best in her. That's how God, God, does, God, God ha, has you in this relationship, in this marriage, so that you can bring out the best in him. So that you can call out the best and believe the best and speak the best inside of that man, inside of that woman, even when it's not even there yet. Just like God did for you. Just like he died for you, even when you weren't even ready, even when you weren't even choosing it. He, he did it and he loved you when you were unlovable. Not even willing to love him back. They're really, look, look, you're really doing yourself a favor. Since you're already one in marriage, you see, when you elevate your spouse, when you believe the best and you speak the best and you see the best, you're really doing yourself a favor because you're one. When you elevate her, you get elevated with her. When you honor him, you get, a, you get honored with him. You're really one in marriage. When you, when you extend your heart and you're vulnerable and you trust, even when inside of you you don't feel like trusting because you've been hurt and you've been wounded, you elevate yourself because you're one in marriage. You're one. 